OMG, it's OMD, made of Orleans, locomotion, sailing on the seven seas, and of course, the first ever uh, top, top hit, Enola Gay. Just some of the hits for British synth band orchestral maneuvers in the dark. Now, a new book called Pretending to See the Future tells their story marking 40 years in music, while the man playing those keyboards, Paul Humphreys, who co-founded the band with Andy McCluskey, is here with us today. Hello. Paul, hello. How are you? Welcome to be here in Wales. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. Well, this is a treat, isn't it, for anyone who loved OMD and still loves OMD? <laughs> uh, but also a treat for any electronic music fan of the 80s. Uh, what was it like for you taking a trip down memory lane? Well, yeah, I mean, this is... First of all, I can't believe it's been 40 years. I mean, Telling in, me, yeah. <laughs> in, in some ways, it feels like yesterday when we started, and in other t times, it feels like a lifetime ago. But, yeah, uh, but yeah we decided to, um, I mean, we're, we're, over the next year, we're going to sort of celebrate uh, 40 years of OMD, and we decided to start with a book. Uh, but we had a book out um, uh, in the 80s, and it was basically just a biography. And we thought, with this book, we should do something different. Because, you know, with the internet now, you can find anything out about, you know, OMD did this, and then they did that. We thought we would, rather it be in our words, we'd, we'd let other people talk about OMD. So we put it out to social media, and we got uh, all the fans to write in about stories of gigs or how music has affected their lives. And we put it out to other musicians and, and people in the industry and artists and stuff. And so many people contributed. So it's it's a really interesting book. You know, as people, you know, Phil O'Keefe from the Human League contributed, Gary Newman, Vince Clark, Moby. Uh, and even Professor Brian Cox did the foreword on the book. So. That's amazing. So how was he involved then? Oh, well, I understand that he was a massive fan. He was of just OMD. a fan. Yeah, I mean, he, he is a because you know he's younger than us, and so when he was a kid, he he got Dazzle Ships, uh, our album, and and fell in love with that, and uh, which was it was just strange because it was our most obscure record that we ever made. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but there was also an obscure song called. Um, uh, called Stanlow on our second album and he just fell in love with that and he made a, it's about an oil refinery on the Wirral and uh, and he made this like four hour round trip just to see Stanlow he was just a massive fan of OMD so so it, you know he really wanted to contribute to the book so we so we let him do the first the, the, you know the forward for it but um, but yeah so it's a it's been an interesting journey and, and to kind of you know I, I was waiting for this you know sitting in the BBC waiting for this uh, interview and I was rereading the book because I got a copy with me and yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, it's just really kind of weird to see all of these, um, you know, all these moments in my life all sort of documented and, and documented by different people and different people's takes on it, on, on what happened to our, so in did, our career. So in this book, were you reminded of moments that maybe you had forgotten <laughs> by fans and by uh, other people in the music industry? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got a pretty good memory of what happened. But yeah, there are some, you know, interesting angles uh, in the book of, you know, p how people have taken our songs and how they've, how they've influ uh, how our songs have influenced their lives. And um, yeah, there's some, some fascinating things. And, you know, it's kind of, um, also, it documents, um, you know, some of the some of the difficult times of OMD as well. We split up for a while, and and Mal, our drummer, had a heart attack in 2013 on stage, and that's and that's all kind of documented, and people's views on that and what happened, and different people's stories about it, and um, and so you know, it's it's a real kind of warts and all book about OMD, and yeah. we've we managed to kind of find pictures of. Uh, that you can't find on the internet with us you know we've sort of trawled our own personal archives and used pictures and and bits from our notebooks about OMD and stuff so it's it's a really nice little sort of document of 40 years uh, we thought you know if there's any sort of license if we had any kind of license to celebrate 40 years of OMD it's 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 now really and yes. so so this is the first of many things and next year we're going to do a world tour to celebrate oh my god so. oh that's amazing that's brilliant news. Are you going to be coming to Wales? Uh, I hope so. I haven't seen the final dates yet because okay. they're not announced yet. But uh, I'm, really? I'm really hoping that we are because, you, know, we, we, you know, we love coming to play Wales. Paul, if Cardiff or Llandidno isn't there, we'll have to have a word, <laughs> all right? Well, we, we usually play Cardiff okay. uh, at the St. David's. So. Okay. Enola Gay, orchestral manoeuvres in the dark. 
their first top 10 single and I'm delighted to say that co-founder Paul Humphreys uh, joins us today. We're talking about the new book, Pretending to See the Future, marking 40 years uh, since uh, OMD uh, have been in the music industry. And going back to Enola Gay, yes. I would have been bopping away to the beats and the melody of that track, not knowing at all what you were what singing about. about. Come yeah. on, remind us. Yes, well, uh, Enola Gay was the plane that the, the the name of the plane that dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima, and uh, so it's uh, it, it's it's all about uh, nuclear war, really, the song, and yet it's sort of dressed in the sugar-coated sort of pretty melody, but it's really it's really a very dark subject. But that that is just so OMD in a way. We've yeah. done that so so often. We'll we'll dress a song in a nice melody and then some sugar coating, but but if you want to delve you know deeper in OMD's lyrics you'll find some quite dark things well indeed and um, uh, the subject matter is quite bleak and Andy McCluskey described your single Maid of Orleans yes. about Joan of Arc as our Mall of Kintyre <laughs> it's got that sort of lift to it the Mall of Kintyre lift of course yes um, it does is it a view that you shared did you yes. write it together uh, uh, yeah it was it was kind of one of Andy's really but I kind of took Andy's idea and moved the chords around and and helped produce it and everything but um, but yeah it's a, it's a great I love the Maid of Orleans and it's oh, uh, yeah. it still says it sounds great today I still love playing it live we play it live every time we play well, let's talk about playing live then, because, um, well, actually, no, before we do, yeah. uh, because I know, you, you know, although we're celebrating 40 years, you are still performing, because uh, yeah. you were performing back in the summer, supporting AHA as well. Yeah, and we headlined all the, um, all the, um, uh, um, the festivals, the, the retro festivals as well. <gasps> we did all the 80s things this summer. Gone uh, well, how much fun is it doing that? Well, it's great fun because you get to see all your old friends because the, it's other 80s bands, and, you know, our contemporaries of the time all are on the bill. So, uh, so it, was, uh, it was great fun doing all these summer festivals, actually, and, you know, doing them all, you know, we did with, with Filoki and, you know, Heaven 17 and, uh, you know, the Human League and, yeah, and, and all of these other bands. So, um, little, so, yeah, it was really good fun. A little bit different to back in the 80s, mind, eh? Because uh, you had huge success, Paul, because you achieved broader recognition through your album Architecture and Morality. It yeah. included three international hits. And then your 1983 album, Dazzle Ships, that you mentioned earlier, yeah. uh, a bit of a fan uh, of Brian Cox's, but with yeah. both albums dominating the music scene during that decade. So you were the electronic band. You weren't the only electronic band around no. that time. What was that time like? Well, it was a really exciting time because, you know, electronic music, the, the, um, the genre really, had only just been invented and, and synthesizers were just being explored as a, as a way to, 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 to make music. I mean, they were a brand new instrument. And so all of a sudden, everyone started to try to use them and try to do different things. And it was a kind of, it was part of the sort of anti-rock movement that we thought we were the only ones uh, doing it. But then, because it was pre-internet, you know, we yeah. uh, we realized that, you know, the Human League were doing it and then Depeche Mode started. And and uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it was it was an exciting time because people were trying to do really different and interesting things. And we didn't quite know where this genre was going. And we were all trying to write interesting songs and try to sound, but still trying to sound different from one another. So, um, so it was a good time. I, I, I loved that time. So, did you hang out with each other, Gary Newman, for ex for example, New Order as well? Yeah, I mean, we toured with with New Order, and uh, we also toured with Gary Newman. In fact, Gary Newman gave us our first break uh, because did you? Uh, yeah, we we were touring, we were playing sort of small clubs um, with uh, Joy Division actually, and uh, he came to one of the London shows and he came backstage and said, "Hey guys, I'm, you know, our friends Electric and Cars have just been big hits and." Yeah and said i'm doing this big tour of the uk and i'm looking for a band to to come on the road with me will you come and we said well gary we, we don't have any money because we didn't have a record a proper record deal at the time oh and he said goodness. he said oh don't worry you can come on my bus and i'll carry all your your equipment in our truck and you all all you'll have to do is is, is find some cheap hotels and it was like all right okay we'll do it then and so we went on tour with gary and uh, we did all of his huge uk tour 
And uh, but at the end of that tour, we signed a, a massive deal with Virgin Records, so and then we went on to success. But Gary gave us our first break, and I saw him only two weeks ago. Uh, he played the Royal Albert Hall, and I went down. I, I texted him and said, "Can I come and see you?" And he said, "Yeah." So uh, so I was hanging out with him backstage, and you know he's he's still a fantastic singer. He's he's just released a great album last year. So he's still doing it, and it was great to see him. Oh my God! What a great, great story! That's amazing. <laughs> you had a leg up from Gary. From Gary. Newman. Yeah, I know. Oh my God! <laughs> and you know, technology uh, has come a long, long way since the synthesizers in the 80s. Paul, did you have, you know, those um, those piano guitars? There's so uh, many. Keytars. The keytars. Yeah, the keytars. Yes. No, I always thought they were really cheesy and horrible, actually. <laughs> yes. So uh, I tried to stay away from them. In fact, I've never played a keytar. <laughs> there are some people like Howard Jones plays one, I think. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I always stayed away from them. Uh, they're, they're, they're still a bit, even though they're a synthesizer, they're just a bit rockish. Uh, really. You're trying to pretend that you've got a guitar and it's a keyboard, and it's like, no. A keyboard, you just stand and play. Does it blow your mind, then, with how technology has changed? And if you were, you yeah. know, if you were having the success that you had in the 80s and early 90s now, how yeah. do you think you would sound? Um, well, we probably sound a bit different. I mean, it's amazing the technology that we have now. And I mean, I'm just kind of, I have a very modern studio and, and we still make new records. You know, we did a yeah, new yeah. album last year. And the, the technology that's available to us now is, is just incredible. And what's actually interesting is that next year we're doing, um, we're doing a, a, a special box set to celebrate our 40th anniversary. I can't say much more. But right. what I did do, I went into the EMI archives and found 22 unreleased OMD songs. And uh, from, from, from our past, and I took them into my studio, and I've been mixing them, and I'm listening to the technology that, they, that we had then, yeah. and, and using the technology now to mix them. And it, it was such a stark contrast. I could, what was interesting is hearing how we were putting our songs together, listening to master tapes, because we had no computers, and it was all very basic and analog. And, uh, and so it was, it's been a bit of an eye-opener over the last few weeks mixing this record, actually. So. How fascinating. Listen, can I ask you as well, yeah. with, um, you know, orchestral in the title of the band, yeah. you teamed up with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra recently. Yes, that was to celebrate the... It was the, actually the first thing to celebrate our 40th anniversary. It was, it was, it was the, the same time... Um, it was like exactly 40 years on from when we played Eric's Club in Liverpool, so we thought to, to celebrate on that day, or it was virtually the day, um, we, we played a weekend with the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra playing a like, two-hour show of our songs with the orchestra, and it was so amazing. I it was bet so that was fantastic. fantastic. Kind of scary and intimidating, because everyone on that stage is a better musician than you are. You know, Andy and I are <laughs> better than Andy I, uh, and I are. Yes. But did, did you find that... Um, you know, the it was a natural progression hearing a music being performed with an orchestra. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it sort of uh, complemented it. Well. Yeah, I mean, what 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 we became aware of was the fact that you know our songs translated into the orchestral yeah. realm, whereas you know some sometimes you hear bands and they they don't translate well. Yeah. So, but but a, a lot of the songs that we, we we chose to to use the orchestra for were fairly kind of okay. I mean, like the Maid of Orleans, for instance. You know, that's that's it's basically strings and choir, <laughs> the whole song, oh really. But gosh. but they're electronically generated. So when you translate that to strings and choir of a of an orchestra, yeah. it's you know it's just a it's the same thing, but in but in a different, more more sort of elevated and. Um, uh, expanded way. Oh, Paul, it's been lovely chatting to you. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you for having me on the show. And uh, remember, of course, the first four albums, uh, OMD's albums, were reissued on vinyl back in November. So, so many That's treats. Right. <laughs> so many treats for fans, of course. Uh, listen, all the very best. Have a lovely Christmas. Have you got a quiet one planned, or is it all singing, dancing, performing? Uh, well, last year I had a, I had a, a, a Christmas in the Caribbean, so, so this, this year I'm spending Christmas at home. Lovely. Uh, light the fire and sit by the tree. With your, <laughs> not with your kita. Uh, definitely not with a kita, <laughs> and I hope no one buys me one for Christmas. <laughs>
because I will still never play it. You set yourself up now. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> one will be in the post, especially for you. <laughs> uh, Paul, it's been lovely speaking to you. Paul Humphreys, uh, co-founder of Orchestra Maneuvers in the Dark, of course, and remember uh, this very special book, Orchestral Maneuvers Pretending to See the Future, uh, is out now.